Kevin, thank you for joining me today. Uh, you're Chief Exec of CABE. Uh, could you explain a little bit about CABE and your role within the organisation? OK, yeah, so CABE is the Chartered Association of Building Engineers and we are one of the professional bodies uh, very much from the UK tradition of learned professional societies by Royal Charter, full member of the Engineering Council. And we represent and help uh, demonstrate the competence of uh, members who are quite a unique group of people that work across the life cycle of buildings and across the, uh, the supply chains within the, within the construction industry, but all who undertake very specific technical roles around the application of technology or standards. So that's what we call building engineering, um, and we see it as a great opportunity to really drive standards and performance of the built environment. Uh, we're here today for Future Build, so it only makes sense that we talk about the Future Home Standard. Yep. So outside of your role at CABE, uh, you're involved with BRAC, and as part of BRAC, you're, the, uh, you're chairing the stakeholder, uh, the working group for the Future Home Standard. So the Future Home Standard set a target to reduce carbon emission by 75 to 80% by 2025, which is not that far away, and even more ambitious target to be net zero by 2050. Is it too ambitious? Are we ready? Can the house building sector meet these challenges? Look, it's a challenge and it's probably going as fast as we can go. But as I often say to a number of people, if you, it is a necessary journey um, and it doesn't really matter which metric you look at, whether it is climate change, whether it is energy security, which is particularly poignant at the moment when we're very worried about where our gas comes from and the economic and political ramifications associated with it. Or if you're just worried about people, you know, that live in homes, they want a good performing built environment, it's healthy, affordable, warm, you know, great places to grow up and live. Um, it's really important we sort out the performance. So it's, it's an absolutely necessary journey. The technology exists to do it. The challenges are within the way our industry is organized, the way we, uh, you know, our procurement supply chains are, and, and things, the fragmented nature of the industry that makes it difficult to achieve. And it is going to be difficult. If we were going to do it without risk or cost, we should have done it 20 years ago, but we didn't. And, and now we really do have to get on with it, whether it's because of our commitments to embating climate change by 2050, for which the built environment can play a very big role, or could be a very big part of the problem. And it's, you know, now is our opportunity to change it from being part of the problem to part of the solution. But it's as fast as we dare go. But it's not without risk or cost. So mentioning risk and cost, um, is it fair to say that sustainability costs and we just have to accept that? Higher performance in the short term is cost. And, and, but a lot of this comes down to how you measure the cost of something. We have an industry, and this is one of the structural challenges, which is very focused on the cost of something at a, in particular the capital cost of something, at a singular point in time. Wait, well, now? At the point of handover and point of construction. If you look at those costs and benefits more broadly, across a wider range of stakeholders, the cost benefit is much clearer and actually very positive. But our industries and our, importantly, our contracts, our procurement contracts, aren't necessarily set up at the moment to take best advantage of that. So it will be perceived as a cost in the industry at the moment because that's the way we're structured. But overall, if you step back and look at it from a, a political point of view, a UK PLC point of view, or even just overall to the broader consumer perspective, this is probably cost positive, uh, as in, a, i.e. a good investment in the longer term. It almost feels that we, we're still at this point, when, and everyone recognises it, that we're not sometimes comparing apples for apples. It comes down to cost for, uh, for an item and you don't look at the cost of a, a particular item that might be more expensive over the next 10, 15, yeah. 20 years. And how the whole we, life cost. Yeah, how do we break that human nature cycle that we seem to be stuck in? Well, I say there's an inevitability around this now and um, I would love to be sitting here saying actually we've reinvented a complete new way to structure the industry and we've revolutionised procurement contracts within the construction sector. We haven't. Um, and the reality is it is now to the point where there is quite a blunt regulatory instrument that is going to drive this through. And you can either take advantage of that or it can become a real hindrance to you and your business. So you are also involved in the uh, revisions to Partel uh, in 2021. Yeah. Uh, where, are we, where are we in terms of transitional arrangements? Under previous Partel, there was effectively a loophole 
where house builders could use a, sort of a meaningful start to start on site. Partel, the, the current Partel, the, the changes, have they closed that loophole? So just step back a second. I mean, yes, the working group looked at the journey to 2025, which included a, an interim step in 2021 that will come into effect in June 2022. Um, as is the case with rip and regulations, there are always transitional arrangements. They're an important part of allowing new regulations to embed into the marketplace without being overly disruptive. It has been felt in the past that um, those people have been able to utilise those arrangements to gain very long advantage in terms of um, which often is politically now felt quite, un, uh, and certainly for the consumers, felt un, a bit unfair. So perhaps it could been stretched too far. So transitional arrangements we are wet will remain. Uh, it's very important that they are, because we don't want to disrupt the house builders. We don't want to disrupt the business of the companies who will be building these new homes. But they will be implemented a bit tighter. So there is tighter language around meaningful starts. Um, coming out in these regulations and I understand some industry guidance coming out as well which is tighter again uh, that works being led by the NHBC but the big change is that it's um, not on a site-by-site -site basis now it's on a building by building basis so um, if you haven't made an indiv a meaningful start on an individual building within 12 months from the coming to a force date of June 2022, you will be expected to revisit the design and construction to bring it up to the new standard. The net effect of this hopefully will be striking the right balance between allowing the industry to, uh, to transition and manage out in an effective way the projects they've already got on the books and they've got planning and finance and everything for, but it will be done on a, uh, but the, the length of time they've got to do that will be much tighter than before. Um, hopefully that's the right balance. Like I said, it, it reflects the necessary nature of the timeline, but also the new political reality that we're, we are living in. We got ten time, more than 10 times as many responses to the consultation as we would normally get for a building regulations consultation. And the vast majority of those responses said, government isn't going far enough or fast enough. And I think so the political wins and the consumer expectation has changed. I'd like to talk a little bit about the performance gap, so the difference between as designed and as built. Um, in many ways, it's relatively easy to design a low energy, sustainable home, but it comes down to quality and sort of the detailing and construction. Um, we've got obviously more you know, ambitious regulatory targets, where are we in terms of closing that performance gap to make sure we are going to be you know, net zero? Um, because this will come down to on-site performance and quality and competence and inspection. Yeah, so uh, it's a really interesting point and it's probably one of the key challenges and it's been a key challenge for the industry for a long time. Um, first of all, I think it's important that we recognise that how far we've already come. You know, we have been progressively tightening the regulations from a carbon compliance point of view since 2002 and we have massively and revolutionally change the performance of expectations of our homes. But you're right, there is a gap between what was expected and what's actually being delivered. And unfortunately, there is no easy answer to that. It is a really complicated issue. There are improvements to the tools and systems and standards we're using, which just need to happen. And I'm very pleased to see after probably a decade of underinvestment, in my opinion, but we think we know what they are and we think those are fixable. There's the unknown, there's the known unknowns, which are the variabilities of how people use their homes, right? No, you can't, those are always going to be there. It's a bit like how fast I drive my car. Probably means I'll never get the miles per gallon that the, um, the manufacturer said. But by buying one that has a high efficiency, I'm still going to get better than I would have um, with, um, if I had got, gone for the gas guzzler. So there's, and that's to do with how people use their homes. You put different families in different homes, you always get a difference. Um, maybe as much as 200%. But those, that's fine, that's just life. The bit we're really worried about, and the bit that the industry ne needs to focus on, and if, and the government has warned in 2012, they will regulate if the industry doesn't fix, is you know, the unknown unknowns. These are the things that, when you take into account all the other stuff, how we design buildings, how we do the calculations, how people use homes, 
there's still far too wide a range of performance in what's actually built. And we can't attribute that to anything else. So that comes down to things like product substitution, uh, build quality, uh, inappropriate detailing, or maybe design detailing that wasn't then carried out on site and wasn't revisited through the calculations. So that's the bit that's going to get focused on. Um, it, we really do need to fix it. For some buildings, it can, you know, we've seen evidence that uh, maybe twice the heat loss from a fabric that there should be. You know, that just shouldn't be happening at this stage. So you will start to see in the 2021 interim step some moves to greater transparency. So individuals having to take accountability for what was built on site and those having to be verified by the energy assessors. And that will include things like photographs and, and site records. Now, again, I'm sure photos will become then the hot issue, um, but it's a simple step forward we can make about creating transparency so that when things do go wrong, you can trace back maybe why, help understand why, and I guess create some accountability. And the logic is if people feel that they will be held account, they might not do it right, they will do it right in the first place. In 2025, however, is that's when I think if the government doesn't see, and this is my personal opinion, can't speak for ministers, hasn't seen material improvement on this, they will start to regulate. And there's an, uh, there's an assumption that a number of technologies which are currently in the development or trial phases will be ready for a much wider use. And so it might be possible to measure the performance or the heat loss in situ in every house easily and cheaply. Now, when that happens, that creates huge amounts of accountability for the house builders. So, and fixing things when the house is finished and the occupants moved in, is very difficult, it's embarrassing, it's expensive. So that puts huge onus on house builders to get it right in the first place. And that dovetails into so much else that sits behind the future home standard, which is this idea of the fabric first approach, really getting the fabric performance and the fabric detailing correct. Otherwise, there'll be a whole bunch of issues, not just performance. So a real focus on that. And it's some very old fashioned ideas. We have to get back to designing in detail the entire house with all its systems. We have to get back to building what we designed. And if you don't, you need to go back and check with the designers and the engineers doing the calculations that the differences aren't gonna have a material effect. It's complicated, but it is achievable. And most importantly, it's really, really important we actually get to grips with this. You've mentioned heat loss, um, but we've also got the other unintended consequences actually of overheating yeah. and uh, poor ventilation resulting in unhealthy buildings. Yeah. Uh, again, why is, why is this happening and how are we addressing that moving forward? Yeah, look, I think it's very important that um, we recognise we've gone on a really important journey and we've made tremendous leaps and bounds moving forward, the energy performance of homes. But that's intake, when making changes to the regulations, Let's also take the opportunity to learn from the things that haven't got, gone so well. And you know, this is a big step for a government to say, look, actually some of this didn't go quite right, but let's do something about it. You've got to be quite big to say, let's take those learning points, but they're really, really important. Um, whether it be overheating, you know, we put a lot of effort in designing homes to keep heating in, in summer, sorry, in winter, but then in, in summer we need to do the opposite. And if you take into account current design practice, if you take into account the ageing demographic of the population, you take into account climate change scenarios which indicate that we're likely to have higher frequency of longer duration hot spells, us humans, particularly vulnerable, older people with underlying health conditions, they need refuge, somewhere they can go to get out of the heat, otherwise it can cause death, um, hasten death, and it mustn't become a distraction, we have to design our homes in the UK or anywhere in Northern Europe to keep heat in in winter. It's the principal heat load in buildings. But we've also got to just keep in mind that we're not making sure we're not creating a, a really hot box that if vulnerable people, particularly those that can't get out on their own, are then subject to heat stress in, in, in extreme temperatures. You know, we know in the hot spell of 2003, I think the numbers are somewhere around 35,000 people, additional deaths that week in France, about five and a half thousand additional deaths in the UK from that, was it a 10 day spell of hot weather? Um, you know, those, and that is forecast to get worse as we move forward. So it's really important we just, it just, we don't create that unintended consequence. And then you mentioned ventilation. 
it's probably the thing that's fallen between the cracks. Um, the evidence suggests it's the least complied with bit of the building regulations. In my mind, it, it should be one of the simpler things to do. Maybe it's because it's seen as simple, it's overlooked. But it seems to fall between the cracks on site. It seems to fall between the cracks of the different people in the design team. It doesn't seem to be getting ownership. Result is poor compliance, poor far too higher rates of poor ventilation in new homes, which has health impacts to people. So um, we've, yeah, we've got to get that right as well. So, and what government will do this time round is simpler guidance on a smaller range of systems. That's not saying that the more complicated systems you can't use anymore. It's just saying that simplified guidance isn't the way to do it. You need to design those systems, have them installed by a competent person and, uh, and properly commissioned. Whether that be a passive stack system or I think very importantly moving forward for 2025, mechanical vent whole house mechanical ventilation heat recovery. This is going to be a key technology to really enabling that performance but we as an industry have got to get better at implementing it effectively because um, it goes wrong too often. Uh, we've recently seen uh, two new additions to the building regs in terms of part O and part S. Yep. Uh, I understand there's sort of a more of a holistic look at regulations um, and we're now looking at a, a new group called FLOSS, yeah. which um, stands for part F, yeah. part L, part O, and S. S. Could you just explain, is, is this more of a holistic approach to make sure that they're all being looked at as a collective? Yeah, it's also recognition there's a lots of other pressures coming on board that you know, we need to take into account. So the Future Homestand was originally looking at um, part L, energy efficiency, F for ventilation, and we looked at overheating. So, so that was revisions to major revisions to two parts of the building regulations and one new part, the provisions for overheating. And then in parallel, uh, a different government department was working on electric car charging infrastructure. Um, and it was felt that given the shift within the building regulations favoring electricity as the primary energy source in homes, the fact that these two policy areas were um, coming forward on similar timelines, it made sense to bring the two together. So part S, the new part of the building regulations S, which is a provision of electric car charging infrastructure where there's a new home with a parking space, um, was brought into the building regulations. Um, so it's the biggest change to the building regulations in 30 years. It's absolutely an aligned, multi-part, set of package of changes on interrelated bits. Um, and of course, uh, now starting to pick up policy areas for the government departments as well. So, very significant set of changes, uh, particularly for electrical infrastructure on sites. We're here at Future Build. So, um, as one final question, I think it'd, it'd be nice to look to the future. So, what do you see as the single biggest challenge we're going to be facing in the near future? Oh, I'm not sure I can narrow it down to a single. What I would say is, I think it's useful to say, okay, we've got a handle on these are the sensible next steps and I think we now know what those look like and we can get on with it and clearly we need to do that well and we need to execute that well because it's necessary it's important it's going to be really expensive if we mess it up but I also think it's a good idea to think maybe not horizon scan because that might be a bit too scary but what are the logical next steps after that and to me there's two other big things coming down the line in the next decade one will be embodied carbon for new builds it just you know once you've got rid of operational carbon to the greater extent, the proportion of impacts are then site impacts and um, materials. I think that's now inevitable. Um, if you'd asked me that five years ago, I would have said it, there's no hope, doesn't seem to be any sign of that being on the regulatory agenda. It will be in the voluntary space. I think that has changed. I, I now see real push around embodied and I would expect certainly this decade to see minimum requirements in the building regulations around whole life building assessment, looking at material impacts, um, even if only at sort of minimum acceptable standards. The second thing, and it's the really big challenge that's but also the big opportunity, which we haven't really got stuck into yet, which is the large scale improvement and decarbonisation of existing homes. Um, that still needs to be done at scale. And so, yeah, those are the next big things on the horizon. Gavin, thank you very much for talking thank to you. me today. Thank you very much.
We hope you found this video from Fabric useful. For more, don't forget to subscribe, browse our playlists, and please like or share this video. Thanks for watching.